there have been calls for to apologize to Mrs. Yeah, Holmes to about ask. the comments about her being the Speaker of the House. We move to replace her with the wife of the Prime Minister so that the head of parliament is now the spouse of the head of government really does not sit well with the tradition that the Speaker must act independently of the government of the day. Are you going to apologize? Certainly not. I think the Prime Minister owes me an apology. What is specifically about being called a flip-flop though on certain issues? I don't know what issues they're talking about. You have been labelled as a man without honour by Tom Tavares Finson. Mark Golden has shown us today that he has neither honour or plans for this Jamaica. But he needs to look into himself when it comes to matters of honour. Yo, people, welcome back to the Fix It's Bonar here with Ari. And we have the next Prime Minister, Jamaica. <laughs> 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 question mark, question mark. Before we get to that, we have to big ups to our sponsors. Ship it, J A. Unlock infinite shopping options. You can follow them on Instagram at shipitja. You can also visit their website at shipitja.com. Sign up, get more info, download their app, all of them things there. So if you're interested in fast shipping, shipitja is where it's at. Also, we're a big up. Churchill Natural Products push past your limits and perform at your best. You can follow them on Instagram at Churchill underscore natural products. All right, shout out Churchill Natural Products International. There we go. As we said, people, we have the next prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the leader people of the side. Leader of the opposition. Fret not, Ari. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, sir Mark Golden, back yeah. with us in the building. Bless up, sir. Yeah, man. Nice to be back with you again. Yes. I don't nice remember how long it is since the last time I was here. Last Probably year. about a little over a year ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me back. Uh, you know, it's an honor. No, we have invited back in a cause. You're at no, sir, man. People must say you take the week. Yes. <laughs> no, but I want, let's talk about the local election that just yeah. passed because mm. it was very contentious. Up to now, people still look unsure who won the election, but um, the Electoral Commission gave it to the Jamaica Labour Party. But Well, initially, but they corrected themselves the, because the result was that in terms of local authorities, mm -hmm. which are elected, mm -hmm. seven went to the People's National Party. Mm -hmm. Seven went to the Jamaica the Labour Party. Party. But if you look at, for example, the popular vote across the country, mm -hmm. the People's National Party won that mm -hmm. quite handsomely by over 21,000 votes. Mm -hmm. We also won the biggest parish councils. Which is KSAC. KSAC and St. Catherine. Mm -hmm. And we won the city municipality of Portmore, which is also very large. Mm. So from our perspective, we feel it was a success mm. yeah. um, for us. And certainly where we were coming from, you know, it, it represented a huge leap forward for right. us. So we were very pleased with those results. And the data, Ari, that we got from the results mm -hmm. makes us feel very comfortable confident mm -hmm. that if we put in the work and continue to represent the people's interests and provide a message of hope for Jamaica, they, we have a very good chance of success. Well, you, in you, general. you said you've said that it's a success and we've acknowledged that as much, but people are saying that, you know, because you're not conceding, say, hey, JLP won, won PNP lost, that the PNP is trying to change the way how local government um, elections is being reported or interpreted. So to that you say what? Let me say I'll be a I, I, say that's, by that. I say that's nonsense. Mm. The anyone saying that has not appreciated the very significant reforms of local government mm. that took place in the twenty early twenty sixteen, mm. where three strategic laws were passed, changing parish councils to municipal corporations and the Portmore municipality to the city municipality of Portmore with its own elected mayor. And indeed, in terms of population, Portmore is bigger than some parishes. Mm -hmm. So if you were to assess the results of the election, I don't see on what basis you could say that we lost them. We have mm -hmm. the same number of elected local authorities as a JLP. So in terms of the number of local authorities, 
it's a tie. Mm. But if you look at the individual um, councils that we won, the largest in the co- largest parish, St. Catherine, the sort of pearl in the capital city, KSAMC, and the overall popular vote mm-hmm. across the country. So I don't, to say we lost, I think is an untenable position for anyone to take. Mm. So you're not conceding. That's mm. the, it not, it doesn't no, certainly like not concede. conceding. There's nothing to concede. And I mean, to be honest, like mm-hmm. looking at the local election, it, it, I'm thinking maybe there needs to be some sort of reform that happens overall mm-hmm. because is it is it by the parishes, the councils, like how do we because before it wasn't really a contention. Like, you know, it's like you win and but then I think this is the first time like it's been there have been unprecedented things happening mm-hmm. in our election and our government in the past few years. So I guess maybe yeah. it should I think be it's some because shift? there were seven and seven. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a, a, a split of the councils mm-hmm. essentially, mm-hmm. and so that you know would lead to speculation as to who the winner is. Mm-hmm. But if you look behind that and you look at some of the significant features of the of the election i think to, it's clear i think that we did better than the jlp in it we got mm-hmm. more votes mm-hmm. we won the major councils and mm-hmm. we won an equal number of councils overall mm-hmm. we took a number of councils from them that they had before yeah that are now with us mm-hmm. you know so from that perspective we feel that we were successful mm-hmm. um and i can i think also the fact that they had you know they didn't celebrate they were obviously despondent <laughs> well, with the I result. Was, well, i was yeah. just going to ask yeah. is yeah. it that because they don't celebrate or that too it all look too bad no, because they don't show the big party of victory and yeah. that look too bad enough to concede because yeah the there's nothing to concede was out there. That, I don't know what we'd be conceding mm. you know based on what I've already said there's nothing to concede mm. well, and we celebrated because we felt victorious mm. we felt victorious for the reasons I've already given mm. the JLP didn't concede it was like a graveyard at Belmont Road headquarters on the night and that's because they know how badly they did mm. if you look for example if you compare the number of votes they got in the local government election of 2024 relative to the general of 2020, Mm -hmm. they fell by over 100,000 votes. We went up. We actually got more votes in this local government election than we got in the general election of Mm -hmm. of 2020. Mm -hmm. So these are significant trends. But wait, hold on, wait, Mm -hmm. because it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven yes. that the JLP won. Mm-hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six. And Portmore. Well, the Portmore was counted as PMP and you guys tied for the case. The, no, we wouldn't, We have the So it's like, even though it's like the JLP got more municipalities. They didn't because we have the KSAMC. We, we select the mayor. We got more, more votes in the KSMC than they did. Well, the vote. Well, that's yeah. why you guys win. They because you, yeah. you both tie, but you get um, the PMP. We, so won we more, control the council, right? right. Yeah, because so we, in that the, way. the mayor has a casting vote. But I guess that's yeah. why I'm saying it's a mm. bit. Um, mm. to me, it's weird because the JLP on the electoral um electoral commission website it says that JLP won one, two, three, four, five, six, mm. seven seats, and the PMP won one, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, and the tie, the KSAMC. I I think to treat the KSAMC as a tie Mm -hmm. suggests that there's no result there. You know, there's no one in control of the council. We are in control of the council. Okay. We elected the mayor. Before this February the 26th, Mm -hmm. the mayor was a JLP mayor. Yes, it was. Since the 26th, it's a PNP mayor. Yes. So uh, I'm treating the KSAMC as As being a win. win. Absolutely. And we won significantly more votes in the KSAMC than Mm -hmm. they did. Mm -hmm. Significantly more. Many thousands more than them. Do you think that there is mm -hmm. a shift? Like, for you, you guys consider the, the local election as a barometer of a shift on perspective for the, the PMP? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I said during the campaign, it's a referendum on the government. Mm-hmm. And if you, uh, I think it was, Mr. Wallace got on his bike and was all over the place trying to do what he could to shore up their fortune. He was on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> that's an expression. That, that didn't make music. He was on motorcades. He was, he was on, he was on, that's an expression. Yes. But you know, he, was, he was trying his best to deliver a victory for, mm-hmm. the, for his side. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, the truth is that Looking at it as a referendum, we won that referendum because mm-hmm. referendums are decided on the number of votes. Right. And we got significantly more votes than them across Jamaica. So the referendum, is it that is it that the, the mm-hmm. JLP is doing poorly or yeah. the PMP is doing better? What do yeah. you think the referendum is? 
I think it's a mixture. I think that there are a lot of people in Jamaica who are very turned off by the current government. Mm. And they're turned off by what perceived arrogance. They're turned off by the harshness of life uh, that they encounter on the day, their day-to-day living. Mm-hmm. And the perceived corruption and mismanagement of the economy, you know, um, is a big issue for many people. In terms of the positive side of it, I think people feel that our party has made significant progress in bringing... Uh, our team together mm-hmm. as a cohesive Facts. force that's true that we ran a good campaign mm-hmm. and that in me as a leader i think they feel i'm hardworking and relatable so <laughs> you know i put in a lot of effort i, I was smirk. <laughs> i was on the ground <laughs> i was doing my thing to you know yeah. deliver the best result that we could at the time and i think people appreciated that Wait, well. where are your thoughts on the eoj's time to reflect the the results of the election because that seemed to be a big thing with this as well because it was announced first by Nationwide that, you know, PNP won. And then, of course, the retraction. So we just want to know, like... Yeah, but then Cliff Hughes is now saying that we won it, you know, again. So, <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> and so, so, you know, I'm not... I'm not in oh, terms of the EOJ performance, there mm. we have some concerns yeah. uh, about how aspects of this whole election were conducted. But, you know, I wouldn't say that the time that it took for the process to be completed mm. yeah, was really there for because there is a preliminary count, mm-hmm. then there's a final count, then, then there are counts. possibilities of ma- what they call magisterial yeah. recounts. Mm-hmm. If it's very close and one side feels that they, they could change the result because of issues like whether a certain ballot should have been rejected, which was mm-hmm. accepted, or vice versa. Mm-hmm. So these processes take a few days, you know. But I think what happened was because announcements were made, which were subsequently retracted and so on, yeah. it confused the situation yeah. in the minds of a lot of people. Yeah. And that, I think, also, to some extent, fell, um, made people a bit frustrated by how long it was taking. Yeah. And the EOJ got the bulk of the criticism for that. Yeah. But overall, I, I'm not... I think the EOJ is a tremendous institution and the ECJ, which is the commissioners that it reports to, mm-hmm. you know, that's one of the best things that Jamaica has developed mm-hmm. by bipartisan work mm-hmm. over, you know, decades. So I'm not here to knock them, but I do think there were some issues of concern mm. in relation to how this election was conducted. Mm. Uh, I don't want to get into the, that here, mm-hmm. the details of it. But we have documented some issues that we are, will be taking up internally because okay. we think they need to step up their game a Especially bit. Especially for the general election. Yeah, yeah for sure. Assuming, yeah. sure. Now, earlier this month at a conference, you proclaimed a corrupt government cannot liberate the people. And if the head of the stream is corrupt, the, the entire river will also be. So what do you think about um, Andrew Holness's clapback video, if you will? Where he posted about, you know, when it comes to corruption, the PNP wrote the book on it. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that has no credibility. I mean, if you know, there have been eight ministers under this government that have had to be sanctioned in, in a variety of ways, mm-hmm. you know, for mismanagement, corruption, nepotism, etc. That's an unprecedented record. Uh, he himself is not in good standing with the Integrity Commission because his statutory declarations to them have not been certified for successive years. So that's a big issue. That's a cloud hanging over his head right now. Mm. And then there's this whole question of the illicit six, these six MPs who the Integrity Commission in their annual report last year said are under investigation for illicit enrichment. That's a corruption offense. Mm -hmm. And I think I immediately audited as best I could our MPs and individually ask them if they have been under investigation or been called to answer any questions because the Integrity Commission itself said that anyone who's under investigation for this enrichment would know because they'd have been asked to respond to certain questions and so on. So you're sure that is well, not I mean, I, no sure, members of the I can't PNP. say sure because okay. it relies on the honesty of the people right. who you're asking. But I went through a process okay. of trying to find out and that mm-hmm. based on that process, none of our MPs, and I, I also asked our senators, you know, none of them, um, based on what they told me, mm-hmm. have, are going through that process. Mm-hmm. The prime minister didn't say that he had individually asked each of his. He just said, oh, well, you know, he, he had some vague response, which was very unsatisfactory. And then he put a gag order on his cabinet so these ministers can't speak to the media about any issues to do with the Integrity Commission, which is a very untransparent thing to do Mm -hmm. and raises further questions as to what the situation is over there. Mm -hmm. So I think there are real issues about integrity and corruption with this government. And, you know, so I think it's fair comment and not just fair comment as leader of the opposition. I have an obligation to point out these things to the Jamaican public. That's part of my role. 
Mm. I would be derelict in my duty if I were to ignore them. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I am fairly forceful about it because governance really matters. If the, if the population don't have trust and confidence in the leaders of the country, it breeds disaffection, cynicism, and a lack of hope. Yeah. So this is why, you know, this is a big issue for me. And in my budget presentation, th- this was an aspect of what I covered because yeah. of the importance that I ascribe to it. I mean, we can go jump into it because um, in your budget speech, you mentioned that, I guess, the conflict of interest that it, it seems to be with the um, Speaker of the House being the wife of mm. the leader of the government. And you're saying, is it that you want her to be removed? Like, what is it? What is your main contention with? I was making a point that we are uh, in a low trust environment. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of things that have happened which are contributing to this low trust environment. Mm -hmm. I I made a number of points uh, uh, giving examples of that, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, including uh, the the issue of the appointment of the the spouse of the prime minister, his wife, Mm -hmm. as a speaker. Yeah, which has established a very un- an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented situation right. in which the head of government, who's mm-hmm. a prime minister, his spouse is a person who runs parliament, mm-hmm. who makes decisions about who, you know, who can speak and who can do what in parliament. Mm-hmm. And especially in the context of how that's been managed since her appointment, that was mm-hmm. really the problem I was having. The issue itself was always one of concern to me. Yeah. But we didn't try and block it at the time we didn't, because it was unprecedented and we thought it, would, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be fair to say at that. And hindsight is twenty twenty vision. But at the time we said, let us see how it plays out. Let us right. see if the, um, Mrs. Holness can be, um, perform that role in a, in a non-partisan uh, and, and fair way. Yes, and not to cut it because people bring up the fact that, you know, her appointment was... Approved by the PNP. Yes, it was. Well, a, well, Fox, there is a yeah. tradition, you see. There's yeah. a tradition yeah. in, pa- in the parliamentary system that we have. Mm-hmm. There's a long standing tradition that because the Speaker is supposed to be above the fray, yes. is not representing a side, but is an umpire of the proceedings. When they're appointed, the opposition is expected to second the nomination yes. mm-hmm. to show that the Parliament has come together and chosen this person. So mm-hmm. when we, when I wasn't there that day, but when it was presented, and there'd been some talk that this might happen, but when it did happen, uh, the, the clerk of the parliament presented a script as to what is to be said procedurally mm. to our leader of opposition business, and he followed the script, and, and you know, it had been explained that this is a tradition, and we had not taken any decision to block it. We couldn't block it anyway, because... It's ultimately, I think, done by majority. And right. they have a huge the majority. majority. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we didn't withdraw from the tradition at the mm-hmm. time because we felt it would be, I think, a divisive thing to do then. Mm-hmm. And there was no, other than the, the apparent potential conflict, the there was perception. no actual issue that we could have raised other right. than that one. Right. And we decided not to take an issue with it. But subsequent to that, we have had real concerns. Mm-hmm. There are these reports that come to Parliament. Yeah. The, the accountability mechanism in the country constitutionally runs through the parliament. So Auditor General, mm-hmm. the Auditor General who audits public bodies and provides what are called performance audit reports, mm-hmm. which have revealed numerous things in, over the years, which have been matters of intense public interest and have resulted in ministers being removed and uh, civil servants being sanctioned and all that kind of thing. The tradition has always been, and the understanding of the correct procedure has always been that when an Auditor General's performance report comes to Parliament, mm. it is referred, it is tabled, meaning that they, it is, becomes a public document yeah. by being included in the, in the documents that are presented on the next day that Parliament sits. Right. So is that for you guys to discuss? That's what you mean? Yes. Yeah, well, okay. it's referred to the Public Accounts Committee then in the case of the Auditor General's reports. Yeah. And they, there's a thorough investigation of her findings okay. and people are someone to come and answer questions on it and all that kind of thing. Okay. Speaking, so speaking of, today it was reported that the Integrity Commission reported that uh, all of its annual investigation reports that were submitted to Parliament have been tabled. So that was reported. Yes, the, no one was saying that that isn't the, in, is not the case. Mm. The, there are two Auditor General reports mm-hmm. that have come to Parliament in January and, and still have not been tabled. And in relation to the Integrity Commission, the point I made was 
the, <laughs> there's a bit of a history to this because the prior speaker who Mrs. had Dim who, right. mm -hmm. who had to resign because she herself was the subject of an adverse investigation by the Integrity Commission mm -hmm. and was re replaced by Mrs. Holness. Mm -hmm. She had embarked upon a process where she wasn't tabling reports as they came and she claimed that on her understanding of the law, she shouldn't be doing that, mm. which was bizarre because this was something which had been done routinely mm -hmm. for the, across administrations over many years. So we had requested that a legal opinion be obtained um, from the Attorney General's General. Chambers on the matter. Mm -hmm. When Mrs. Holness became the speaker and was implementing the results of that opinion, she refused to share the opinion with us. Right. So she relied on it, but wouldn't share it which is, mm -hmm. in my view, very suspicious and wholly inappropriate because it governs how Parliament is conducted. We are all members of Parliament. Mm -hmm. So an opinion about how Parliament is conducted should be shared with the members. And indeed, on a matter like this, should be made public. Mm -hmm. She declined to let that happen after repeated requests for it, okay. including requests made by me as leader of the opposition. Mm -hmm. Then in her ruling as to what would happen going forward, she said that there are some categories of Integrity Commission reports that are not going to be tabled as they come, but will be sent to the Parliamentary Integrity Commission Oversight Committee. There is a, a special committee of Parliament that has been established to look into matters as to how the Integrity Commission is functioning, whether they have enough resources, whether they have issues in the law that need to be changed, and that kind of thing. Now, the government side have the, the majority on that committee, they have, and they appoint the chairman so they control that committee. And if a report is sent to that committee without being tabled, the public won't know about it. Mm -hmm. Don't know what it says. Yeah. And the timing as to when that committee meets, and they have not been meeting frequently, hmm. what is on the agenda for the meeting is entirely up to the government. So if there's something that they're uncomfortable with and would prefer not to come into the public domain, that procedure that she has entrenched by that ruling is given an opportunity to be abused and going, I have a, forward. going forward and mm. I have a big problem with that. Mm. Now it is true that there are no currently outstanding reports that have been sent to the right. integrity and I never said there were. Mm -hmm. The two reports that are outstanding and haven't been tabled are Auditor General Performance Reports, not mm -hmm. Integrity Commission Reports. Okay. But they are, are, those are outstanding and they should have been tabled long ago. They mm. were received in January. Mm -hmm. So based on this and what, what, everything I've just summarized for you, I have concerns that they having the, the spouse of the prime minister, who himself has issues with the Integrity Commission, as I've said, with his own filings and so on, his spouse is running the parliament's procedures as the umpire. It, it is not consistent with the tradition that the speaker is supposed to be above the fray an independent neutral umpire mm -hmm. and that's a very important issue and so i'm not calling for her resignation okay but i'm making the point that the way in which it's being conducted by her yeah. gives rise to a real perception that this is an issue and that i would have loved if she would correct it mm -hmm. release the opinion mm -hmm. and i think reverse the ruling right. that says that certain reports aren't going to be tabled before being sent to this committee that the government controls in parliament that is a highly unsatisfying factory way to run our democracy but with mm. um and just to bring up um speakers speaker holness's point she said that she defended her decision to send reports from the integrity commission to its oversight body before tabling as government and opposition legislators sparred over the non-disclosure um of the attorney general's opinion on the matter and she said that her decision is not inconsistent with the law so meaning she's not breaking any laws well. so you think that even though to you it's probably unprecedented this whole thing mm with the wife and the, the, the being the speaker and the, the, the husband being the, the leader of government, it, it really is unprecedented, but it's not illegal. What she, oh, no, she it's not illegal. To. So then why bring it up? Because there are many things about life which are not strictly speaking in breach of a law, but they're in breach of principles okay. of transparency and accountability so and good governance. Hmm? To you, it's unethical. To you, it's unethical. To me, to, to me it is, it is the perception. It, not only the perception now, but the reality of it okay. is that the parliament is being conducted mm -hmm. with decisions being made, which I think are not in favor or consistent with principles of good governance and transparency mm -hmm. and the holding of the government to account mm -hmm. in Parliament, which is one of the roles of Parliament. Yeah. So it's problematic if it, if, if it is not corrected. And that is what I'm saying. 
and I, and and there and it's happening in a context where we've had eight ministers, as I've said, since 2016, sanctioned one way or another. Mm -hmm. One is before the criminal courts. Others have had to resign. Okay. Uh, others have been put in a naughty corner at the office of the prime minister, etc., etc. Et <laughs> Eight of them. You know, that's just one issue. <laughs> yeah. And numerous public boards yeah. appointed by these ministers ha have had to have their chairman changed and so on. Mm -hmm. Petrojam, Nessal, and many, many more. Mm -hmm. CMU, the Caribbean Maritime Institute. And it's a long list mm -hmm. of nepotism, corruption, etc. reported on by the Auditor General and or the Integrity Commission. So we're in a low trust environment right. where we need governance to be elevated from this. Mm -hmm. And these sort of, by putting in this particular arrangement yeah. with the Prime Minister and his wife, yeah. one ahead of the government, the oh, other the umpire in Parliament, he himself not in good standing with the Integrity Commission. Mm -hmm. There may obviously be situations where something comes to Parliament could concern him. And she would then have be, you know, in a position to affect the outcome of that matter. Mm -hmm. So that's just not a desirable but, but, state of affairs. You know, Mr. Golding, I was mm. wondering about it since you brought it up. And it's mm. true, it's unprecedented. But, you know, it's not... There have been a son and father in parliament, um, yeah, you know, wife, yeah. well, and Marie de Vaz's name now. You no, know, I mean, voices. it's all different thing of being yeah. an MP. Right. We've, I mean, nobody is suggesting that you can't have somebody who's a spouse, I mean, a spouse of an MP being an MP. There have right. been examples of that. But the, the point really is the, the position of speaker right. is, a, is a very important position. But, it's, but mm -hmm. the speaker of the house usually comes from the governing party so i was yes. wondering do you think that then with this now being a situation that could arise going forward should the 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 how the speaker is elected be changed perhaps, like coming from an perhaps. independent like truly independent because it's, it again, can't you're really, an empire, it can't really umpire. it can't really under a parliamentary system yeah. yeah because the the speaker is a member of parliament right. who's appointed to that role right but We've never had an issue, really, where somebody who is perceived as having a clear conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, I mean, I've always yeah. wondered, because if the Speaker of the House is coming from the governing party, that means that you're more biased towards the party it that you're coming be. from. You should, well, you're, it shouldn't be. If you're taking are, on that role, yeah. you, you take it on with the understanding that on procedural matters, you have to be fair and even-handed. Yeah. And you have to r play that part that you've been given responsibility to play in accordance with the traditions of even-handedness, transparency, etc. So even before... So, so for example, right. in some other jurisdictions, the person who is running and to be the speaker mm -hmm. doesn't, is not opposed in an election in their seat. The, the other party doesn't put up a candidate because the understanding is that person should be allowed to be elected and shouldn't have to face the, um, the, 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 you know, an elect, a competitive elective process. Mm -hmm. That has happened, I think, in other jurisdictions. Like other Caribbean countries, I think? No, I think in the UK, for example, okay. is okay. how it works. Mm -hmm. This is where the tradition comes, comes from. from. Right. So... We have never had an issue like this. That's you know, what I was asking. Like, where there where we have built into the structure of who the speaker is, yeah. this kind of relationship which gives rise to the potential problem, yeah. which is why when the appointment was originally made, I had some concerns. Others had some concerns, but it hadn't arisen before. We didn't think at the time, especially with what had happened with the previous speaker, mm -hmm. where we had been you know, part of the discussions around which she was uh, an environment was created where she felt compelled to to resign right, right? and you know the, the i felt it was time to calm things down a bit and let's see how it plays out that yeah. way it will it didn't <laughs> <laughs> it didn't so she was deputy speaker right so she can, yeah well the deputy yeah. speaker is a different thing yeah altogether. no i'm yeah, saying yeah, that yeah minister um miss holness was the mrs holness was the deputy speaker she was. and then um miss Marissa had to leave, so she kind of yeah. But it didn't. It doesn't. So it's people. not a night follows day thing. The decision yeah. as to who should be the speaker yeah could have taken into account that you know there there was a clear issue mm -hmm. in appointing the, the wife of the prime minister. I mean, I would never personally have done that. Mm -hmm. You know, I would have seen that this is potentially problematic. Mm -hmm. But at the time, as I said, we didn't feel it was worth 
or the correct thing to do to try and block it, which we couldn't do anyway, because if they were in, if they were insistent on it, they would just pass the motion by the majority that they right, have. Right. Whether we second it, if we wouldn't second it, somebody else on mm-hmm. their side would have seconded the motion when they put to a vote and mm-hmm. would pass. Mm-hmm. So it is really what has happened since yeah. that has given rise to the concerns, which really um, led to me in my budget speech last Tuesday mm-hmm. to say, look, this is one of the things that is contributing to a low trust environment. Speaking and of your, no, your budget speech and how well it yeah. went, you know, when you made your critique of Mrs. Holness, did you expect the reaction, the, the, yeah. the reaction and the walkout and all of that? Well, first of all, it wasn't a critique of Mrs. Holness. And I think it's important to say that because mm-hmm. people keep using that expression. Yeah. It was a critique of the arrangement mm-hmm. implemented by the prime minister, really, mm-hmm. to have his spouse the, be the speaker. I have nothing against Mrs. Holness personally. In fact, I enjoy a cordial relationship with her. And, you know, she's a, a lady who has achieved many things in her life and, you know, respect due. So I have nothing against Mrs. Holness. And I would always be polite to Mrs. Holness and courteous. But the arrangement, mm-hmm. which has built a, in, in, you know, put in place a kind of structure of potential conflict of interest, mm-hmm. is what I was criticizing. Mm-hmm. When he reacted the way he did, uh, well, I wasn't expecting him to, to, to storm oh, out in a fit of pique. No, I wasn't. That you're low. Well, whatever he wants to say. <laughs> I didn't expect him to Desperate. do that. A bean uh, has born. Wow. Because it, it's, very, it's bizarre. <laughs> yeah. mm. It's bizarre that the government, which controlled the parliament by their majority, walked out of their own parliament. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, I had said earlier in the speech that we're only 14 out of 63. We're little, but we're Talawa. But, you know, I didn't realize how Talawa we were that we could cause the <laughs> government to abandon parliament. Yeah. You know, it was unprecedented. Yeah. So I was taken by surprise by it, to be honest, because mm-hmm. it's never happened before. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm never, I'm not aware of any situation in which the government with their majority has walked out of parliament mm. um, leaving the opposition in there without a quorum so I couldn't it's complete my speech, speech right? you know and, and they could easily have fixed that by coming back there was a five minute period that they had to reflect they chose not to mm. so you know I went outside and there were some of our supporters there and I finished my speech that right was inspired then. though it I was. must say like you know no, like no, no, the budget is usually it's in government um, no one really cares but the fact that you actually completed it outside I mm-hmm. guess it give kind of some sort of for the people kind of vibe. So. It felt that way. Yeah. You know, it reminded me of 1938. You know, long yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, there was a, I, I went, I climbed up onto a wall and yeah. and um and spoke to the people from there. And, yeah. and I mean, my speech was nearing its end anyway, so mm-hmm. it wasn't a long thing. Yeah. Uh, but there were some important points that I had not yet said, right. which I think was one of the reasons why the, why the Prime Minister elected to, to run out and, and cause the thing to come to an end, because he had a copy of the speech. Mm. Unlike yesterday, where we've not received any copy of his speech, he mm. did not circulate copies of his I'm speech. I'm still vexed with him. Well, whatever. I mean... <laughs> I don't know what they have to hide. (laughs) No, the norm is, you know, the norm is, the norm is that when you're in the budget debate, indeed, anybody making a formal speech speech. in Parliament Mm -hmm. provides copies. Right. Yeah. And I provided copies. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they had that and they knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. And I think he didn't want to have the the points that I was about to make made in his presence. Right. Mm -hmm. The question is, though, when when he walks out and ends parliament, is it that your remain like it's not put in public record that that does that affect your speech like being on the public record or there's a thing called Hansard, which is the um, there are some stenographers Mm -hmm. who who record what is said in Mm -hmm. parliament. So the, the my speech, the part of it, which wasn't delivered in Parliament because it was brought to an end in that way mm-hmm. will not be recorded in, in Hansard. Mm. Yeah. So in but this, in the modern world, it was recorded yeah. maybe by other means. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> it's all, and, many, and Jamaica knows what I had to say yeah. because it went viral. But yeah, so, whose idea was that? It was yours to, to, to continue it outside? I don't know. To be really honest, we, we were like, like, what should we do? And we were talking about it and we said, let's go outside and deal with it. Okay. I don't remember whether it was my idea or someone else's, but we went outside and we dealt with it. Mm-hmm. Who did I tell Robin to say, move, you get fired? Julian Robin. was Julian. Yeah, Prime Minister fired. Yeah. That was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. But you know what's so funny, Mr. Gody, like both you and the government or the, the opposition and the government have had issues with the Integrity Commission. We've seen, I've seen that like, 
you know, say you said be fair, golden request of integrity commission, and this was in 2023. So it's like both. So I was even saying that there was like some consensus between the opposition and the government that the integrity commission is probably you know not being transparent according to the the, the article no, I was reading. Well, the, some... the one issue that I have criticized them on mm -hmm. um, arose back in last year. I think it was January mm -hmm. where. The Prime Minister had been, had been the subject of an, an investigation by them mm -hmm. from going back to a period when he was just Minister of Education. He had mm -hmm. not yet been made Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And there were some concerns about the way in which he was giving friends contracts to okay. do with his constituency. Mm -hmm. And he was found to have breached um, the proper procedures. Mm -hmm. And that report came to the Parliament. Now, it turned out that... The, that matter had been referred to the corruption prosecutor, the okay. director of corruption prosecutions, okay. within the Integrity to Commission, to see whether or not charges should be laid. Mm -hmm. And from a month before it was tabled, mm -hmm. and that, that the corruption prosecutor had looked at it and basically said that so much time had passed, it wouldn't be viable to mount a prosecution. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that ruling had been made by her. Mm -hmm. But that was not... When the, when the report on the investigation was brought to Parliament, it wasn't disclosed at the time that the ruling had already been made that he would not be prosecuted. And as a result, you had this report saying the Prime Minister had breached you know, various rules and regulations and so on. And it, it was a huge furore. And had that information been available on a prompt basis, that yes, that had happened, but there would be no prosecution. It would have given rise to less speculation as to whether right. he's going to be charged and right. all this other thing. Mm. So I felt that was wrong. Mm. And I criticized them for, the, you know, for that. Because they were saying, well, you know, they, they released it, I think, a day later or something. But in the context of the modern world where news flies instantaneously virtually, mm -hmm. they should really have submitted both things um, contemporaneously, in my view, or or certainly the report, the ruling of the the, the corruption prosecutor should have been made available to Parliament immediately after mm -hmm. it was tabled. Mm -hmm. That wasn't done, and I believe the Integrity Commission itself has uh, adjusted their procedures so that in the future this won't happen. Right. So I was critical of that. Right. So because yeah. I was like, I know there was mm -hmm. at some point that you both both parties or both both sides like had, I guess. I guess fair criticism towards the the integrity yeah. commission and even dubbing it the illicit six. I was like, was that the media or was that you like dubbing the six unnamed? Um, yeah, of I don't know. I mean, I don't. Again, I'm not so going to claim like authorship sense, of that. But, yeah, the but it, it's, a, it's quite. A, I think it's it's quite a useful way of describing them. But then again, you don't know. But you, you said that you're not con well. You're not certain that if it's the the members of your party are yeah. a part of the illicit six. So I mean, mm -hmm. even then, sensationalizing. If any of our mem if any of our members turn up being any of that, mm -hmm. they should face the consequences. Right. Mm. But I'm very but I believe that they are from the government side. Mm -hmm. And the point really is that I believe that the Integrity Commission must operate in a fair and transparent right. way. And where I see that they have fallen short in that, mm -hmm. I will say so. In the the one the one criticism that I've made publicly of them was really a matter involving the Prime Minister where I felt he hadn't been treated fairly by mm -hmm. them. And I was saying that, that you know, that was, I think, a, a mistake on their part right. and they should correct their procedures going forward. Why not just name them? So to have this in the ether of like, who, who is it? Who? Yeah, who? Yeah, like, no, no. There's it, a reason. It, yeah. There's a reason for that. And, and the, re I, the reason for that is that the law does not allow them to disclose who they are investigating until the investigation is complete. And they have sent their report to Parliament. So at the time when they referred to it in their annual report, where they were basically giving data about the work that they've been doing, and mm -hmm. they said, you know, we've received this many Integrity Commission filings, and we've reviewed this, you know, there's a lot of data about their yeah. operations. And they did mention that there are six MPs under investigation for this in Richmond. Mm -hmm. um, now, whether they should have said that or not in their right. annual report, I don't know. There's nothing to prevent them saying that because it's a generic statement without yeah. calling any particular individual's so name. So then who's amplifying this 
Yeah, that's the effect of it. Yeah. Especially with how long it's taken yeah. for these investigations to be completed mm -hmm. and the matter sent to Parliament, you know. And I have an issue with that. I, I think, think, that, I, think I, I don't like it because it feels as if... I mean, you're playing politics with government business, uh, to me at least, and I just feel like instead of like just naming it and then having a shroud of mystery of like, who is it being? It's like political theatre and like you're playing politics with yeah. something that is is government business and the public interest yeah so i just don't like that i understand your point thing. and I, i'd say generally speaking <laughs> it's important in a, if a situation like that arises mm -hmm. they should be in a position to present their reports to parliament quickly right. rather than lead to a situation of speculation and conjecture right yeah well, i just want to circle back to the whole you know budget debate you have been labeled as a man without honor by Tom Tavares Finson, seemingly endorsed by the PM, um, posted a video to his Instagram. There have been calls for to apologize to Mrs. Yeah, Holness to about ask. the comments about her being the Speaker of the House. Are you going to apologize? Certainly not. I think the Prime Minister owes me an apology mm. for having walked out. Uh, you know, in, in, during my it. during my speech and preventing me from from completing mm. when I never said anything disrespectful to anyone, I was making a point of principle, which I think is a valid and sound point and needed to be made mm. because of what has happened since since Mrs. Holness became speaker, which mm. I've already gone over with, yeah, and I don't yeah. want to go over it again. Mm -hmm. As to what Tom Tavares says about me, well, he needs to look into himself when it comes to matters of honor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so in your um in your budget speech, I wanted to mention some things, like highlighted some um some of the points that you made, and the income tax threshold is one of them. Um, I remember when the the PMP was like it wouldn't work, but you weren't party president at the time. But now it seems as if the party the PMP is now on the the side of increasing the threshold to two million. I guess your point was just like why one point seven, so you want it to be two. No, what uh, there's a, a run up to this. When the announcement was made by the JLP in opposition yeah. during that, the election campaign of 2016 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they were going to increase the threshold, which was then around $600,000 mm -hmm. to $1.5 million, they said that it, wouldn't, it would pay for itself and there yeah. wouldn't need to be any new taxes. Yeah. And we said then that is impossible. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that it was impossible to do it that way because when they came to government, they increased taxes by $30 billion over two years to pay for the 1.5. Like but which taxes? Because I remember a whole them, host of them. I remember them going, GCT going down. No, no, no. Various taxes, including um, import SCT on items, import GCT, taxes on cigarettes. So it was a whole. It was a range of measures mm -hmm. that were imposed in the 2016-17 budget mm -hmm. and the subsequent um, the subsequent years budget, 2017-18 budget, mm -hmm. totaling just over 30 billion dollars to pay for the loss of revenue. That giving by that increasing the, the threshold would have cost, right? Mm. So they really deceived the people in their election promise by if they'd said this is going to cost thirty billion dollars and we're going to increase all these taxes to pay mm. for it, it wouldn't have been a successful election promise. Mm -hmm. So I, that's why I say it was a deception. Mm. All right, but they did it, and you know I think the nation has accepted that. Yeah, now. we haven't crumbled since. We haven't crumbled, <laughs> and really, the reason we haven't crumbled is because the reforms mm -hmm. that were brought to the economy by the Porsche Simpson and Miller administration which I had a role in by, I was chairman of the Legislation Committee of Parliament, and a lot of the structural reforms involved legislative changes to the tax code and the Tax Collection Act and the TAJ Act and various things. And, uh, you know, those have borne fruit and the revenue base of the country has grown. Mm -hmm. So when they say no new taxes, there's been a significant increase in the, in the amount of taxes being collected by the population. Yeah. Uh, in fact, when in 20... 16 when we demitted office the taxes collected from the people uh, was 24 percent roughly mm -hmm. of the gross domestic product of the country mm -hmm. it is now 28 it's over 28 so a much bigger slice of the national pie is being taken in taxes now than then because people argue that because the gdp has gone up as well of course taxes no, okay. absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. And inflation and so on. Yeah. Because, yeah. But when you look at the percentage of GDP that is taken in taxes, that's a significant um, um, metric because mm -hmm. this, you know, 24% versus 28% of GDP. GDP has gone up, mm -hmm. but the percentage of GDP that you're taking in taxes has gone up.
Some people argue, also argue because of, you know, people are earning more, so that... No, but yes. Well, earning more? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean... Because unemployment has gone down. Yeah. All taxes have gone up, really, mm -hmm. in terms of the amount collected. GCT in particular, at the Pwarf, and domestic GCT. The special consumption tax, which is another thing that's levied on certain items at the wharf, or in the case of oil, levied, levied by, by Petrojam when they sell the imported oil once refined. Mm -hmm. Those have all gone up. And PAYE deductions have gone up because salaries over, you know, it's a decade or more since then. So, mm -hmm. you know, salaries have gone up. But the point really is, if you look at it, inflation, accumulated inflation since 2016 has been about 40 something percent. And yeah. the, amount, but the, the actual amount by which taxes have gone up in terms of collection mm -hmm. has been ahead of inflation. And so that's another significant metric. So Jamaica is a more heavily taxed economy now mm -hmm. than it was um, as, a, as a slice of the overall pie, an expanded pie, yes, because the economy, although it's not growing at any fast rate, has grown over the over the period According since Nigel then. Nigel Clark, when him they roll out the big sheet of paper, you know, mm. nobody did say tax more than the PNP. <laughs> mm. mm. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so my funny. point about the threshold <laughs> was that having established that one point five, yeah, was a, a was where the threshold should be, and that was in twenty sixteen, and we're now in twenty twenty four. There's been accumulated inflation over that period, so the purchasing power of people who are earning up to 1.5 has been diminished by inflation. So right. if you were going to adjust it for its real value to be preserved, mm -hmm. you need to increase the threshold. Right. And you remember that in the election campaign, the prime minister said he's coming with 1.5, 2.0. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that was... Uh, yeah. <laughs> so people were expecting an increase and we had called for an increase mm -hmm. um, because we said, look... That 1.5 is not worth what it was back then now, mm -hmm. so you need to adjust it. So my view is that to move it to 1.7 wasn't very meaningful. It's about $4,000, you know. You're right, it yeah. cannot be. <laughs> yeah, $4,000 a month, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so that's not very significant. And yeah. I was saying that, you know, they could have, they came up with this reverse tax credit idea of giving, you know, $20,000. Yeah. I'm saying, you know, I think a more meaningful increase to the threshold was what people were looking for, and it could have been funded by that. Okay, yeah, so instead yeah. of giving out the twenty thousand, just ensure that the, the just raise, the raise the threshold. Yeah, and but I guess six and one half does not. You know, it's a very different thing still. Okay. Yeah, because the, the, you know, the the people who will benefit from it um, are those who were expecting a threshold increase. You know, and. If the, if the if the threshold had been increased, many of those people, you know, would have got more of a benefit than the twenty thousand dollars. Because if you're earning, if you'd increase the threshold to say two million, which you could have funded if you hadn't put in this reverse tax credit thing, mm -hmm. you know, the, it's a hundred and the, the 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 benefit is is worth significantly more. It's fifty thousand dollars, which is um, the tax rate is twenty five percent. Of the two hundred dollars increase, two hundred thousand dollars increase of mm -hmm. the threshold, yeah. mm -hmm. so the benefit is fifty thousand dollars. Whereas if you put the benefit um, to, if you put the threshold from one instead of to one point seven, mm -hmm. you put it up to two million. Yeah, it's one hundred twenty five thousand dollars would have been the value of the increase the threshold. Okay. Yeah, so that's something. So I guess it's just it's like inflation really kind of distort. Well, I don't want to use now. Distort isn't a word, but like. The inflation really is affects everything. Yes, the inflation, that, does, yeah. yeah. So, okay. so I'm just saying, my what why I'd call for an increase last year in the threshold was because, you know, cost of living is high, mm -hmm, and facts. you know, for people who are er earning, you know, two million dollars to three million dollars, you know, what, what they can buy with that is what 1.5 million could buy back then. So mm -hmm. I'm saying you know, make the adjustment so that the real value of this threshold is, is restored. Mm. You know, and they agreed that there should be some adjustment because they made an adjustment, yeah. but they, the adjustment that they made wasn't very meaningful. That's my point. Okay. Yeah. Tom Tavares Finson also said that you like to flip flop on a number of issues when they no longer suit your political agenda. I.e. The, the payment for the Member of Parliament. Yeah, yeah, and, and also other what, things. What's so, that? So, so to oh, that main payment. You got to increase the salaries. Increase, yeah. No, I, I from I day one they announced that I said that was wholly inappropriate. Really? Yeah, what? because uh, how can you give yourself two hundred to three hundred percent increase when you've just forced the teachers basically to accept twenty percent? It's not fair. 
and the rank and file civil servants, police officers and so on, were not happy mm -hmm. with the way in which those things were handled. Mm -hmm. And you sign off with them and then you go and announce that you're awarding yourself 200 to 300 But then you just said inflation affects everything. Yeah, but so it's not too, no, but the inflation has been 200 to 300 <laughs> percent well, since that period, since mm -hmm. the last increase. Mm -hmm. And in any event, if, 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 if you're, if you're going to look after yourself as the leader of the country mm -hmm. and your team so well, while the civil servants and public servants who are unhappy, many of them are giving up the profession and migrating and so on, you're giving them a very modest increase of 20% or thereabouts. It does to me, and the whole, it wasn't just me who felt upset about it, the whole society felt upset about it. So that's why we, we said that was really an inappropriate decision. Uh, and I maintain that it was. I think it was an but inappropriate But members decision. of your party were... Um, happy for the increase, the salary As increase. individuals, I don't know. I mean, no, they publicly said it. Yeah, yeah well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I would imagine anybody who is earning more is happy to get more. Yeah. But I'm saying, looking at it from the point of view of the principle of it, mm -hmm. and what was the right decision at the time, mm -hmm. and the way you were treating yourselves as the persons who have the power, mm -hmm. versus how you treated others who don't have the power, mm -hmm. whose interests you will have a responsibility to deal with in a fair and equitable way. It didn't pass. So that you don't test. believe that MPs like you wouldn't you if you weren't um, the the prime minister you wouldn't have given or you wouldn't have raised the salaries for the. If MP? there was an adjustment to be made to MP salaries, yeah. I wouldn't have made that decision. Mm -hmm. I would have set up a structure with independent persons to look at the whole situation, mm -hmm. look at what the last increase was, what inflation has been since then, what MPs are earning in other jurisdictions which are comparable to us, mm -hmm. and make a recommendation that we could then decide whether to accept or not. I don't think it was right for the people who made the decision for others and said 20% was sufficient for them to say, well, in our case, it's 200 to 300% that's appropriate for us. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't look right. And the public reacted to it very negatively. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember. But yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, so, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my point. You know, I think that it was the way in which it was handled was wrong in principle. And, you know, I, I felt very uncomfortable with it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's why I criticized it. But if you specifically about being called a flip-flop, though, on certain issues. I don't know what know. issues they're talking about. What like about even, like even the Miss yeah. Juliet Holness um, situation, yeah. her being the Speaker of the House when it had the stamp of approval from the PMP, essentially. I don't know if you want to go over that again, mm. but I've explained to you that <laughs> yeah. at the time, it was uh, presented to us on the day that Parliament was sitting mm. that this was a decision. There was a tradition which was expressed by the clerk as to the way it's done, mm. and we decided not to oppose it. That's not to say we, in, we were happy with it. We weren't happy with it. And in fact, I spoke to it at the time or shortly thereafter saying this is a very peculiar arrangement. And, you know, but we didn't resist it. But now that we've seen how the speaker has conducted herself on these critical issues affecting mm. transparency and accountability and the way parliament holds the executive to account, I'm very uncomfortable with that. And I felt obliged to say so. I don't know if that's why that would be considered flip-flopping, but I think it, you know, it, it represents a development of my position based on what has actually happened mm. since she was appointed. Well, I mean, I understand your position with the Speaker of the House, but mainly it's just like the salary increase because mm -hmm. I'm sure that, because I saw where everybody's like, welcome the increase of salary. And I thought mm -hmm. that it was just adjusted for, because there are more civil servants than there are like um, MPs. So mm -hmm. I guess it based on that, but I'm, no economic, so no. I'm just simply sorry, saying. So I, really, I'm, my point is a simple. But one. I understood that you know you have the salaries. You have the lower. public servants. Mm -hmm. They were, many of them were disappointed by the increase that they got, mm -hmm. and many of them are critical to this development of the country. Mm -hmm. And we need our teachers. We need our nurses. We mm -hmm. need our police officers. We need our correctional officers. We need them to feel motivated and inclined to to work and serve the people and build national development. And so when you impose on them a salary increase, which many of them are uncomfortable with, mm -hmm. and within a month or so afterwards, you award yourself a massive increase. And it's 300% is a massive increase. Yeah. You know, it didn't sit well with the public and it didn't sit well with me. And I said so at the time and I say so now. So I'm not flip-flopping, I'm being consistent. A <laughs> couple yeah. more questions before, you know, because mm -hmm. you know, say so you're a busy man. What do you think about Nigel Clark? seemingly refusing to 
reveal the details surrounding receivables. I think you said that yeah. you asked him and that he said the yeah. information was market, market sensitive. sensitive. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's, it's unacceptable. You come with a package of measures, um, tax relief, et cetera, uh, changes to the tax code that you quantify as $25 billion it's going to cost for the year. And then when you, you're supposed to say how you're going to pay for it, Mm -hmm. as a minister of finance and you say well we're going to securitize some receivables now what does that mean Who, which receivables uh, you know what what form does this transaction take i mean you're, this is about how you fund your budget mm -hmm. you know where's the whole purpose of the budget exercise is to be open and transparent that's why we have to table revenue estimates we have to table estimates of expenditure we have to table a fiscal policy paper you have to table your medium term debt strategy you have to table a tax expenditure statement which is taxes given up by waivers and so on the whole system since the reforms that we made in the last PNP administration, when the IMF agreement was being performed properly and not mm -hmm. abandoned like the JLP had abandoned the one before, mm -hmm. this is a whole new regime of transparency. So when you come with some measures now costing $25 billion and, you don't, and you're not saying any, with any clarity how you're going to pay for it, I don't think that's good governance. And mm -hmm. I said so. And he said, well, you know, it's market-sensitive information, but hey, what's going to be more important, that the, that the, the place is governed in an open and transparent way? Or, you know, some concerns about how the market will receive certain information. That's right. Just circling back to the matter of yeah. salary increase, what did, you, what did you do with yours? I believe you, you vowed to give it to charity, right? Yeah, I, I, I said I was going to um, apply the 80% of the increase, mm. that, which is above the 20% the that the minimum that everyone else got. I said I was going to spend on worthy causes. So my retroactive... Because there was a retroactive component, a mm -hmm. lump sum, I gave that to a number of charities. Uh, That's a public record. Well, I re I I disclosed who I gave the money to. Who? You know, yeah, food for the poor, missionaries of the poor, mustard seed, Joy Town Foundation, which are they, a Christian organization that does work in Trench Town. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember if there's any other that I'd given the. I'm seeing. I think you listed. Oh, um, Fair Club Trust oh. Fund. Jamaica oh, yeah, the Paralympic Association. Huh? Um, oh, Jamaica yeah. Paralympic Association. Yeah, the Jamaica Paralympic yeah. Association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah, they had asked for some help for their sports program. Oh. Yeah. So you're gonna. This is going to be a consistent. Um, well, what I've been doing since is there's a. We've had a problem with illegal dumping of garbage mm -hmm. in certain open spaces mm -hmm. in my constituency, mm -hmm. and the Solid Waste Management Authority has been unable to manage that mm -hmm. so you get these huge pileups of rubbish and it attracts rats and flies and people get fed up and they light and burn it mm -hmm. and then all these toxic s smoke yeah. blowing into the community i was mm -hmm. really despondent about it because we had a number of them mm -hmm. so i have put together a program where we appoint some wardens from the community to monitor those spaces we clean them up and we've provided them with drums and some tools to keep to keep them clean mm -hmm. and i'm using it to so this is coming out of your personal my personal pocket yeah okay one of yeah. the biggest takeaways i think there's about seven different sites yeah. the worst one is on asquith street which is i mean um where the rubbish was it was such a large dump site the rubbish was coming into the road Roads. and making mm. it a single lane traffic yeah but there's several other spots as well mm. uh, you know and so you see the beautification in your constituency then that's one of the well i was just thinking it was just inconsistent with dignified living for yeah. people to have to live around this mm -hmm. and it was very unsanitary and yeah so i i felt that was a worthy cause and mm. i've been kept that going um, I mean, ultimately, I said I was going to keep this up until the matter with the teachers has been settled, mm -hmm. you know, because they had some outstanding complaints mm -hmm. about what their package, which were unresolved. Mm -hmm. I, I think those are still unresolved mm -hmm. when they when you know, once they have settled and if they sign on there, OK, then I may. I don't know what I will have to decide what I do then, but I've kept it going. <laughs> I've kept it going. And I, I don't see I don't think I'm going to give up on it because it would just go back to the way it was before. Yes. And, you know, yeah. I, I don't want that to happen. But, you know, there may be other ways of, of dealing with it. So I'm investigating, for example, whether we can't do some separation of the plastic waste mm -hmm. and then, you know, bring uh, one of the recycling agencies in yeah. to see if they could, you know, because they buy the plastic waste. Yeah. So, yeah, so that could help to fund the cost of 
the people who monitor it and collect it and so on. Public mm-hmm. education has to happen though. Because yeah, I, I, like, I don't know why people constantly do this, like throw it away. But you maybe. Know, you know, Harry, mm-hmm. most of that waste, you know, is not even people in the community doing, you know. It's people who drive through? People drive through in trucks and dump commercial waste there. Because we've we've had taken pictures and sent those pictures yeah, to solid waste. Yeah, for yourself. Right? Huh? Um, it, 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 it for yourself. Like, yeah, it's like, well, I've seen photographs. Yeah, no, yeah, I've seen evidence. No, so, yeah. the, then the, if it's the corporate entities, commercial people, they have to be fined and sanctioned well, for that. Well, I think the the have solid to. waste people have an investigative right. branch, and they have, you know, I think we there were a couple of occasions where we got the license number right. and so on, and they've no, have looked to be. into it. Yeah, I mean, um, it's terrible. one of the things that you brought up in your budget debate that I really want you to if go through it is like no bank fees for basic services and I know that Mr. Fitzjackson this is one of his champion causes it is. so I mean what are you removing what you, and what you mean by basic fees so it's like using the ATM trans, trans, like, yeah I mean he, he's, he has actually brought legislation to yeah. parliament um, on two occasions because there's a whole history to that I'm not mm. going to get into it but there's a bill before parliament no it's been there for a while now to implement a regime in which there would be a certain number of transactions per month that you would not pay um, any fees on. Okay. Yeah, and you know you would know that the first X number of transactions to the month is mm-hmm. no no fees. Okay. And I mean that's one of the aspects of what he wants to do. Yeah, because yeah. even so, it's inconsistent with the banks according to the bank. So, yeah. um, Sajikor has one. Um, Scotia has a different Scotia. So, Scotia has a different one. <laughs> Woosa. Jane have a different one. So it's like each bank has their own Don't fees. Think. So even if it's even if it just can make it just very basic, like fear across the board for each yeah. bank. Well, the concept that we have because I know it's a money making thing. Everybody have to make their money, but yeah, just make but it. But you fear. know, banks have a variety of ways of making money. True. To go to the bank to uh, to 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 mm-hmm. for a person like an actual person to deal with it is a charge. Yeah. That's crazy. So uh, the point we're making is that there must be a basic minimum um, service, clutch of services Mm -hmm. that as a a customer of the bank, you don't get hit with fees for. Because Mm -hmm. remember, banks make money off the money that you bank with the bank. Mm -hmm. That's the main way that banks make money, you know, because Mm -hmm. they receive funds and they take those funds and invest them either in loans or in other interest bearing assets and so on and that's really how they make their money Mm -hmm. they also make money on foreign exchange trading Mm -hmm. that's another major area where they buy if they buy you have us and you want to convert they buy it from you at a at a rate that's lower than what they would sell it to you if you were buying it from them Mm -hmm. so you know there are various ways that banks make money and look there's nothing wrong with that you know because banks are there they provide a service and they need to be paid for it just like the fix earns money from what it does they Mm -hmm. must earn money what they but they can't be rapacious Mm. in how they deal with the public it always be like hidden fees like yeah. you said, what is this? Like you go through your statement, yeah. you say, what? Like, and yeah, and they they charge like you raise to, the level of distrust with e- people with the banking system. Yeah. I mean, with yeah, everybody. it's not satisfying. <laughs> they charge you to, to con- you know, to cash a check. They charge you to make a lodgement. They mm-hmm. talk to make your withdrawal. They charge mm-hmm. you for all, everything virtually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you confident that this can, I'm, like, can this be policy? That can this be? I, it can be policy. Uh. It can be policy. And we're going to make it policy by mm-hmm. passing the necessary law. Mm-hmm. We're going to have further discussions with them. Because mm-hmm. I believe when you're doing anything that affects somebody's business or life, you should have the opportunity to hear what they have to say about yeah, yeah. it and so on. But we, and we've had some of those discussions with them already. Mm-hmm. But that's been a while back now. We would have another set. But we are determined to provide think, the public with a, with an, a, a, a fairer system right. as to how they're treated. Because I, one of the things that I was concerned about too, because... Um, most of these banks are overseas, like they're they're headquartered overseas, and they come to the Caribbean Some of country. Them are. So it's like, would that be a possibility of them leaving? Because no, if I, they don't, if you, if they don't agree with you, um, the new policies. I don't believe none of them have made that threat. Okay, uh, and you know they're very heavily invested here, mm-hmm. and they're making plenty of money here. <laughs> so I don't see why they would. You know, this may affect <laughs> their revenue in a small way, okay. but it would affect the public in a very positive way. Yeah. yeah. One of the biggest takeaways I saw from you know your budget presentation was that a lot of people were saying that you know you know how far with no real solutions. I miss it like you try to combat that by are you DM Tropics? Are you personally DM Tropics with solutions? <laughs> Mr. Tropics post I say <laughs> Mark Mark Golden, um DM does 
uh, to oh, yeah, yeah, clear yeah. up some things. I actually yeah. saw that's how I saw the bank fees. Uh, I'm like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Like yeah. when, when <laughs> is this? Do you think like this is a problem? for you to solve or it's just that people just need to tune in more like even with the budget presentation it seems like people don't really watch thoroughly mm-hmm. to hear well what part of what that. happened with my budget presentation this year is because this whole furor occurred with yeah. the government side walking out etc yeah you know a lot of the actual substantive recommendations that i'd made in my speech mm. you know didn't get the level of attention that i would have liked mm. but it is for us to continue to um, disseminate those because there's a lot of things that we i said in that speech mm. which i think the public would be you know interested in hearing so it is for us to continue to make it available through the v- various channels of communication that are now open i don't know if we had a, if we spoke about it the last time but even with the local election voter apathy is one thing that i think frustrates the, the electoral process like many people mm. kind of don't feel to participate mm. in the electoral process um you f- you consider you know a, a major shift or increase in votes for the people's national party but really it was like 28 percent nine point six yeah, right yeah. of the of the population came not out. the population of the voters of registered Vo- voters, voters yeah. but still like that yeah. is a paltry figure it so is. even so like what are some of the things that you you personally are willing to do to come back voter yeah. apathy and why yeah. why is it that people feel distrust for both parties because it's not just the people's not um not just the jamaica labor party because mm. you know older vo- yeah. older voters like remember finsac and other certain major political scandal that the pmp um yeah well i don't part know finsac was not a, <laughs> finsac yeah. is not a scandal it was a response to a, a serious problem right that but, had arisen and mm-hmm. you know and they the scandal is that the JLP paid $150 million to have a commission of inquiry, which mm. has never delivered a report. Mm. That's the scandal. Okay. But anyway, just to, <laughs> to go back to your, to get, go back to your yeah. main point. Like both I, I ge- wanted, like I just generations. Wanted to, I think it's important yeah. to say, make two points. First of all, in the recently conducted local government elections, mm-hmm the number of voters who voted relative to the last local government elections in 2016 increased by 15%. Mm. Over 80,000 more people came out to vote two weeks ago than voted in 2016. So it isn't a situation where that has been a declining number. The number has actually gone up. The 29.6% is an issue which I think needs to be looked at. And Mm -hmm. part of the problem with that number is that the voters list itself has not gone through a cleanup exercise, a re-verification exercise Mm -hmm. for a very long time Mm -hmm. now. So you have a lot of people on that list who no longer live in Jamaica. A lot Mm -hmm. of people have migrated. Mm -hmm. There are people who have died, Mm -hmm. but their deaths have not yet been noted. Even though an attempt was made to deal with that aspect of it, the dead voters aspect of it, you know, it still has there are still people on the on the voters list who are no longer with us mm-hmm. so the, if you're looking at 29 uh, percent you know the, the 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 total which you're comparing the number of voters with the, uh, the, who actually voted with the total potential mm-hmm. voters is how you derive the 29 percent and if the total number of voters on the list is an inflated number it would tend to reduce that percentage so i'm just saying that's part of the problem with this narrative because we don't really know what the real number of voters is you know in terms of how many people ought to be on the list Mm. as opposed to how many people are on the list Mm. but that's not to say that voter apathy and cynicism about the process is not a real problem it is and you know part of the problem i think is that there's a lot of deception and dishonesty in how we communicate as as politicians and public leaders and you know people here everything is being spun this way and that way and so on. Part of that is as a result of being in a competitive environment and so that you're going to have that kind of, you know, the, the, that kind of discourse is, is tends to lend itself to a competitive environment. Mm-hmm. But I think if we are more honest and open about acknowledging where we're falling short and mm-hmm. being, you know, and, and giving credit to others for where, where credit is due, <laughs> then we would have, a, a, I think, an environment in which people felt greater levels of trust and confidence mm-hmm. in the system itself. Unfortunately, I think there's a lot of um, 
weakness in that area. <laughs> Put it that way. Yeah, I, I, I can only tell you that I try to be um, an, as honest and fair mm -hmm. in how I describe. I may be strident mm -hmm. in my criticisms on issues which I feel strongly about. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't deny that. You know, I'm try I try to be courteous, but I do. I, if I need to be forceful, I will be forceful because sometimes these are important issues of principle, mm -hmm. which not everybody in the population may be aware of or get have, or understand the implications of it. And part of my role as leader of the opposition is to bring their attention to it and to explain it in a way which puts it in its proper context so they can consider it and decide whether they feel that this is a serious matter that they should be concerned about as well. Mm. It's part of what I am obliged to do. You so know what I think will, will, will help as well? TikTok. Just get those TikTok views up. <laughs> Mr. Gold, you know? Yeah, learn some new dances. <laughs> I see one where I'm near a million. <laughs> which one? Eh? Which one? That again? Uh, I remember. So I look... I look um, to do, with your daughter, uh, I saw somewhere your daughter, or is there, is yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 Who's the chain? Who's idea? Yeah, the chain. Oh, Big Stone, man. Big uh. Stone. Big Stone, uh, you know, he he um came up. He came and said, you know, he want to do a thing where him come up on stage and with his chain around him neck and give me the key and me uh. Uh, open the key. Yeah, so, you know. I think that should have been immediately rejected. <laughs> <laughs> apparently. Apparently. I saw the back of the show and everybody had to Apparently, say, but, but you know. <laughs> You live yeah. and you learn. You live and you learn. <laughs> Never you know? again. Yeah. You know, I think the, the idea, the message was, you know, that liberating the people from the oppression that they feel they're under now. But it was spun in a particular way quickly by my opponents. And, mm. you know, and uh, by with everyone. on reflection, on reflection, <laughs> it was. Uh, yeah. 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 I accept that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There we go. It was right. a gimmick, you know. Yeah. So any final words to the people, Mr. Golden, you know, on it? What, what you want to say? I do want to ask you about the Portmore as a parish thing, but that's a whole nother yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, too. yeah. yeah what's being from Portmore and everything. No, I would yeah. just say to the people who are watching, especially young people, um, you know, sh pay attention to what is going on in the country. You know, you're, you have a, your whole future ahead of you. And what happens and the way the country is run, and the honesty of the people running it and the way in which the system is dealt with, that is supposed to be a system that allows choice and fairness in how choices are made. These are very important issues. So I would say to you know, your viewers and especially the younger ones, don't just ignore the thing and say, can't bother with that and just live in your own little bubble. You know, pay attention to what's happening and try and get involved to mm. help build your nation Facts. because the future generations need those who are alive now to do what they can to make it better. Politics affects us all. So yeah. I always wonder why people are so apathetic to the process. Like yeah. every even if you if if you don't vote, you vote. And everything yeah. that you do, it's it yeah. it affects us all. So Well, you know, there was a time when people were more concerned about think the, the effect of the life on the community and they felt mm -hmm. part of the community and mm -hmm. it, 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 then th that shifted to being people being more self-centered yeah. and more thinking about themselves yeah. and you know only being concerned with their own situation mm. and i think that's part of what has contributed to the, yeah real cultural shift yeah, yeah society yeah. Really, really has shifted yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. but i also want to thank you for having me yes. thank you for for forwarding your sense when the you know, time was over an hour we know you're a busy person yeah you know, well you wouldn't let me go bro <laughs> <laughs> you've answered all our questions well most of our questions well, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not good, but yeah. Yeah, yeah i mean give thanks where can the people follow you on social media yeah mm -hmm. All and the read your budget they paid. I was actually yeah, reading your yeah, budget speech. Yeah, where them speech. can read like transcript mm -hmm. of this the speech. It's, there's not a, just the, it's the, the full the speech. full speech. Yeah, yeah. on his website, yeah, Mark yeah, Golding. Yeah. Please do, please read it. Yep, it's on the website. my website. Mark Golding JA. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. You <laughs> <laughs> can Google it, you'd find it. Yeah. Mark has yeah. people for these things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Yes. Thank you, man. Thank we'll you, see man. how the general elections go. We'll see. Yeah. What do you think the man owns it? 
You ready? This year, next year, you ready? We're, 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 especially after local government elections, and mm. we've, you know, we've learned a lot mm-hmm. from that. Mm-hmm. That will help us to be even more competitive. Yeah, you definitely feel, feel a boost from that. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. 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 Let's see. <laughs> All right, people are the fix smart goal in. The we next are. prime minister. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> we got no people.